Section 13 of Shadowings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Shadowings by Lafcadio Hearn. Section 13. Fantasies. Vainly does each as he glides, fable and dream of the lands which the river of time had left ere he woke on its breast, or shall reach when his eyes have been closed. Matthew Arnold Nocte Luce The moon had not yet risen, but the vast of the night was all seething with stars, and bridged by a milky way of extraordinary brightness. There was no wind, but the sea, far as sight could reach, was running in ripples of fire, a vision of infernal beauty. Only the ripplings were radiant, between them was blackness absolute, and the luminosity was amazing. Most of the undulations were yellow like candle flame, but there were crimson lampings also, and azure, and orange, and emerald. And the sinuous flickering of all seemed not a pulsing of many waters, but the laboring of many wills, a flitting conscious and monstrous, a writhing and a swarming incalculable, as of dragon life in some depth of Erebus. And life indeed was making the sinister splendor of that spectacle, but life infinitesimal and of ghostliest delicacy, life illimitable yet ephemeral, flaming and fading in ceaseless alteration over the whole round of waters, even to the skyline, above which, in the vaster abyss, other countless lights were throbbing with other spectral colors. Watching, I wondered and I dreamed. I thought of the ultimate ghost revealed in that scintillation tremendous of night and sea, quickening above me, in systems aglow with awful fusion of the past dissolved, with vapor of the life again to be. Quickening also beneath me, in meteor gushings and constellations, and nebulosities of colder fire, till I found myself doubting whether the million ages of the sun-star could really signify, in the flux of perpetual dissolution, anything more than the momentary sparkle of one expiring Noctiluca. Even with the doubt, the vision changed. I saw no longer the sea of the ancient east, with its shudderings of fire, but that flood whose width and depth and altitude are one with the night of eternity, the shoreless and timeless sea of death and birth. And the luminous haze of a hundred millions of suns, the arch of the Milky Way, was a single smoldering surge in the flow of the infinite tides. Yet again there came a change. I saw no more the vapory surge of suns, but the living darkness streamed and thrilled about me with infinite sparkling, and every sparkle was beating like a heart, beating out colors like the tints of the sea fires, and the lampings of all continually flowed away a shivering threads of radiance into illimitable mystery. Then I knew myself also a phosphor point, one fugitive floating sparkle of the measureless current, and I saw that the light which was mine shifted tint with each changing of thought. Ruby it sometimes shone, and sometimes sapphire. Now it was flame of topaz, Again it was fire of emerald. And the meaning of the changes I could not fully know. But thoughts of the earthly life seemed to make the light burn red, while thoughts of supernal being, of ghostly beauty and of ghostly bliss, seemed to kindle ineffable rhythms of azure and of violet. But of white lights there were none in all the visible, and I marveled. Then a voice said to me, The whites are of the altitudes. 
by the blending of the billions they are made. Thy part is to help to their kindling. Even as the color of thy burning, so is the worth of thee. For a moment only is thy quickening, yet the light of thy pulsing lives on. By thy thought, in that shining moment, thou becomest a maker of gods. End of section 13「Section 14 of Shadow Wings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April 2017. Shadow Wings by Lafcadio Hearn. Section 14. A Mystery of Crowds. Who has not at some time leaned over the parapet of a bridge to watch the wrinklings and dimplings of the current below, to wonder at the trembling permanency of surface shapes that never change, though the substance of them is never for two successive moments the same? The mystery of the spectacle fascinates, and it is worth thinking about. Symbols of the riddle of our own being are those shuddering forms. In ourselves, likewise, the substance perpetually changes with the flow of the infinite stream, but the shapes, though ever agitated by various interopposing forces, remain throughout the years. And who has not been fascinated also by the sight of the human stream that pours and pulses through the streets of some great metropolis? This, too, has its currents and countercurrents and eddyings, all strengthening or weakening according to the tide rise or tide ebb of the city's sea of toil. But the attraction of the greater spectacle for us is not really the mystery of motion, it is rather the mystery of man. As outside observers we are interested chiefly by the passing forms and faces, by their intimations of personality, their suggestions of sympathy or repulsion. We soon cease to think about the general flow. For the atoms of the human current are visible to our gaze, we see them walk and deem their movement sufficiently explained by our own experience of walking. And, nevertheless, the motions of the visible individual are more mysterious than those of the always invisible molecule of water. I am not forgetting the truth that all forms of motion are ultimately incomprehensible, I am referring only to the fact that our common relative knowledge of motions, which are supposed to depend upon will, is even less than our possible relative knowledge of the behaviour of the atoms of a water current. Everyone who has lived in a great city is aware of certain laws of movement which regulate the flow of population through the more crowded thoroughfares. We need not for present purposes concern ourselves about the complex middle currents of the living river, with their thunder of hoofs and wheels. I shall speak of the side currents only. On either footpath the crowd naturally divides itself into an upward and a downward stream. All persons going in one direction take the right-hand side, all going in the other direction take the left-hand side. By moving with either one of these two streams, you can proceed even quickly, but you cannot walk against it. Only a drunken or insane person is likely to attempt such a thing. Between the two currents there is going on, by reason of the pressure, a continual self-displacement of individuals to left and right, alternately, such a yielding and swerving as might be represented, in a drawing of the double current, by zigzag medial lines ascending and descending. This constant yielding alone makes progress possible. Without it, the contrary streams would quickly bring each other to a standstill by lateral pressure. But it is especially where two crowd streams intersect each other, as at street angles, that this systematic self-displacement is worthy of study. Everybody observes the phenomenon, but few persons think about it. Whoever really thinks about it will discover that there is a mystery in it, a mystery which no individual experience can fully explain. 
in any thronged street of a great metropolis thousands of people are constantly turning aside to left or right in order to pass each other whenever two persons walking in contrary directions come face to face in such a press one of three things is likely to happen either there is a mutual yielding or one makes room for the other or else both in their endeavour to be accommodating step at once in the same direction and as quickly repeat the blunder by trying to correct it and so keep dancing to and fro in each other's way until the first to perceive the absurdity of the situation stands still or until the more irritable actually pushes his vis-a-vis -vis to one side but these blunders are relatively infrequent all necessary yielding as a rule is done quickly and correctly of course there must be some general law regulating all this self-displacement some law in accord with the universal law of motion in the direction of least resistance you have only to watch any crowded street for half an hour to be convinced of this but the law is not easily found or formulated there are puzzles in the phenomenon if you study the crowd movement closely you will perceive that those encounters in which one person yields to make way for the other are much less common than those in which both parties give way but a little reflection will convince you that even in cases of mutual yielding one person must of necessity yield sooner than the other though the difference in time of the impulse manifestation should be as it often is altogether inappreciable for the sum of character physical and psychical cannot be precisely the same in two human beings no two persons can have exactly equal faculties of perception and will nor exactly similar qualities of that experience which expresses itself in mental and physical activities and therefore in every case of apparent mutual yielding the yielding must really be successive not simultaneous now although what we might here call the personal equation proves that in every case of mutual yielding one individual necessarily yields sooner than the other it does not at all explain the mystery of the individual impulse in cases where the yielding is not mutual it does not explain why you feel at one time that you are about to make your vis-a-vis -vis give place and feel at another time that you must yourself give place what originates the feeling a friend one attempted to answer this question by the ingenious theory of a sort of eye duel between every two persons coming face to face in a street throng but i feel sure that his theory could account for the psychological facts in scarcely half a dozen of a thousand such encounters the greater number of people hurrying by each other in a dense press rarely observe faces only the disinterested idler has time for that hundreds actually pass along the street with their eyes fixed upon the pavement certainly it is not the man in a hurry who can guide himself by ocular snapshot views of physiognomy he is usually absorbed in his own thoughts i have studied my own case repeatedly while in a crowd i seldom look at faces but without any conscious observation i am always able to tell when i should give way or when my vis-a-vis -vis is going to save me that trouble my knowledge is certainly intuitive a mere knowledge of feeling and i know not with what to compare it except that blind faculty by which in absolute darkness one becomes aware of the proximity of bulky objects without touching them and my intuition is almost infallible if i hesitate to obey it a collision is the invariable consequence furthermore i find that whenever automatic or at least semi-conscious action is replaced by reasoned action in plainer words whenever i begin to think about my movements i always blunder it is only while i am thinking of other matters only while i am acting almost automatically that i can thread a dense crowd with ease indeed my personal experience has convinced me that what pilots one quickly and safely through a thick press is not conscious observation at all but unreasoning intuitive perception now intuitive action of any kind represents inherited knowledge 
the experience of past lives in this case the experience of past lives incalculable utterly incalculable why do i think so well simply because this faculty of intuitive self-direction in a crowd is shared by man with very inferior forms of animal being evolutional proof that it must be a faculty immensely older than man does not a herd of cattle a herd of deer a flock of sheep offer us the same phenomenon of mutual yielding or a flock of birds gregarious birds especially crows sparrows wild pigeons or a shoal of fish even among insects bees ants termites we can study the same law of intuitive self-displacement the yielding in all these cases must still represent an inherited experience unimaginably old could we endeavour to retrace the whole course of such inheritance the attempt would probably lead us back not only to the very beginnings of sentient life upon this planet but further back into the history of non-sentient substance back even to the primal evolution of those mysterious tendencies which are stored up in the atoms of elements such atoms we know of only as points of multiple resistance incomprehensible knittings of incomprehensible forces even the tendencies of atoms doubtless represent accumulations of inheritance but here thought checks with a shock at the eternal barrier of the infinite riddle end of section 14 Section 15 of Shadowings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Shadowings by Lovcagio Hearn. Section 15 Gothic Horror. 1. Long before I had arrived at what catechisms call the Age of Reason, I was frequently taken, much against my will, to church. The church was very old, and I can see the interior of it at this moment, just as plainly as I saw it forty years ago, when it appeared to me like an evil dream. There I first learned to know the peculiar horror that certain forms of Gothic architecture can inspire. I am using the word horror in a classic sense in its antique meaning of ghostly fear on the very first day of this experience my child fancy could place the source of the horror the wizened and pointed shapes of the windows immediately terrified me in their outline i found the form of apparitions that tormented me in sleep and at once i began to imagine some dreadful affinity between goblins and gothic churches presently in the tall doorways and the archings of the aisles in the ribbings and groinings of the roof i discovered other and wilder suggestions of fear even the facade of the organ peeking high into the shadow above its gallery seemed to me a frightful thing had i been then suddenly obliged to answer the question what are you afraid of I should have whispered those points. I could not have otherwise explained the matter. I only knew that I was afraid of the points. Of course the real enigma of what I felt in that church could not present itself to my mind while I continued to believe in goblins. But long after the age of superstitious terrors, other Gothic experiences severally revived the childish emotion in so startling a way as to convince me that childish fancy could not account for the feeling then my curiosity was aroused and i tried to discover some rational cause for the horror i read many books and asked many questions but the mystery seemed only to deepen books about architecture were very disappointing i was much less impressed by what i could find in them than by references in pure fiction to the awfulness of gothic art particularly by one writer's confession that the interior of a gothic church 
seen at night gave him the idea of being inside the skeleton of some monstrous animal and by a far famed comparison of the windows of a cathedral to eyes and of its door to a great mouth devouring people these imaginations explained little they could not be developed beyond the phase of vague intimation yet they stirred such emotional response that i felt sure they had touched some truth certainly the architecture of a gothic cathedral offers strange resemblances to the architecture of bone and the general impression that it makes upon the mind is an impression of life but this impression or sense of life i found to be indefinable not a sense of any life organic but of a life latent and demonic and the manifestation of that life i felt to be in the pointing of the structure attempts to interpret the emotion by effects of altitude and gloom and vastness appear to me of no worth for buildings loftier and larger and darker than any gothic cathedral but of a different order of architecture egyptian for instance could not produce a like impression i felt certain that the horror was made by something altogether peculiar to gothic construction and that this something haunted the tops of the arches yes gothic architecture is awful said a religious friend because it is the visible expression of christian faith no other religious architecture symbolizes spiritual longing but the gothic embodies it every part climbs or leaps every supreme detail soars and points like fire there may be considerable truth in what you say i replied but it does not relate to the riddle that baffles me why should shapes that symbolize spiritual longing create horror why should any expression of christian ecstasy inspire alarm other hypotheses in multitude i tested without avail and i returned to the simple and savage conviction that the secret of the horror somehow belonged to the points of the archings but for years i could not find it at last at last in the early hours of a certain tropical morning it revealed itself quite unexpectedly while i was looking at a glorious group of palms then i wondered at my stupidity in not having guessed the riddle before two the characteristics of many kinds of palm have been made familiar by pictures and photographs but the giant palms of the american tropics cannot be adequately represented by the modern methods of pictorial illustration they must be seen you cannot draw or photograph a palm two hundred feet high the first sight of a group of such forms in their natural environment of tropical forest is a magnificent surprise a surprise that strikes you dumb nothing seen in temperate zones not even the huger growths of the california slope could have prepared your imagination for the weird solemnity of that mighty colonnade each stone gray trunk is a perfect pillar but a pillar of which the stupendous grace has no counterpart in the works of man you must strain your head well back to follow the soaring of the prodigious column up 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 through the abysses of green twilight till at last far beyond a break in that infinite interweaving of limbs and lianas which is the roof of the forest you catch one dizzy glimpse of the capital a parasol of emerald feathers outspread in a sky so blinding as to suggest the notion of azure electricity now what is the emotion that such a vision excites an emotion too powerful to be called wonder too weird to be called delight only when the first shock of it has passed when the several elements that were combined in it have begun to set in motion 
widely different groups of ideas can you comprehend how very complex it must have been many impressions belonging to personal experience were doubtless revived in it but also with them a multitude of sensations more shadowy accumulations of organic memory possibly even vague feelings older than man for the tropical shapes that arouse the emotion have a history more ancient than our race one of the first elements of the emotion to become clearly distinguishable is the aesthetic and this in its general mass might be termed the sense of terrible beauty certainly the spectacle of that unfamiliar life silent tremendous springing to the sun in colossal aspiration striving for light against titans and heedless of man in the gloom beneath as of a groping beetle thrills like the rhythm of some single marvelous verse that is learned in a glance and remembered for ever yet the delight even at its vividest is shadowed by a queer disquiet the aspect of that monstrous pale naked smooth stretching column suggests a life as conscious as the serpent's you stare at the towering lines of the shape vaguely fearing to discern some sign of stealthy movement some beginning of undulation then sight and reason combine to correct the suspicion yes motion is there and life enormous but a life seeking only sun life rushing like the jet of a geyser straight to the giant day three during my own experience i could perceive that certain feelings commingled in the wave of delight feelings related to ideas of power and splendor and triumph were accompanied by a faint sense of religious awe perhaps our modern aesthetic sentiments are so interwoven with various inherited elements of religious emotionalism that the recognition of beauty cannot arise independently of reverential feeling be this as it may such a feeling defined itself while i gazed and at once the great gray trunks were changed to the pillars of a mighty isle and from altitudes of dream there suddenly descended upon me the old dark thrill of gothic horror even before it died away i recognized that it must have been due to some old cathedral memory revived by the vision of those giant trunks uprising into gloom but neither the height nor the gloom could account for anything beyond the memory columns tall as those palms but supporting a classic entablature could evoke no sense of disquiet resembling the gothic horror i felt sure of this because i was able without any difficulty to shape immediately the imagination of such a facade but presently the mental picture distorted i saw the architrave elbow upward in each of the spaces between the pillars and curve and point itself into a range of prodigious arches and again the sombre thrill descended upon me simultaneously there flashed to me the solution of the mystery i understood that the gothic horror was a horror of monstrous motion and that it had seemed to belong to the points of the arches because the idea of such motion was chiefly suggested by the extraordinary angle at which the curves of the arching touched to any experienced eye the curves of gothic arching offer a striking resemblance to certain curves of vegetal growth the curves of the palm branch being perhaps especially suggested but observe that the architectural form suggests more than any vegetal comparison could illustrate the meeting of two palm crests would indeed form a kind of gothic arch yet the effect of so short an arch would be insignificant for nature to repeat the strange impression of the real gothic arch 
it were necessary that the branches of the touching crests should vastly exceed both in length of curve and strength of spring anything of their kind existing in the vegetable world the effect of the gothic arch depends altogether upon the intimation of energy an arch formed by the intersection of two short sprouting lines could suggest only a feeble power of growth but the lines of the tall medieval arch seem to express a crescent force immensely surpassing that of nature and the horror of gothic architecture is not in the mere suggestion of a growing life but in the suggestion of an energy supernatural and tremendous of course the child oppressed by the strangeness of gothic forms is yet incapable of analyzing the impression received he is frightened without comprehending he cannot divine that the points and the curves are terrible to him because they represent the prodigious exaggeration of a real law of vegetal growth he dreads the shapes because they seem alive yet he does not know how to express this dread without suspecting why he feels that this silent manifestation of power everywhere pointing and piercing upward is not natural to his startled imagination the building stretches itself like a phantasm of sleep makes itself tall and taller with intent to frighten even though built by hands of men it has ceased to be a mass of dead stone it is infused with something that thinks and threatens it has become a shadowing malevolence a multiple goblinry a monstrous fetish end of section fifteen Section 16 of Shadowings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rich Burgess. Shadowings by Lefcadio Hearn. Section 16. Levitation. Out of some upper story window, I was looking into a street of yellow tinted houses. A colonial street old-fashioned, narrow, with palm heads showing above its roofs of tile. There were no shadows, there was no sun, only a grey, soft light as of early gloaming. Suddenly I found myself falling from the window, and my heart gave one sickening leap of terror. But the distance from the window to pavement proved to be much greater than I supposed, so great that, in spite of my terror, I began to wonder. Still I kept falling, falling, and still the dreaded shock did not come. Then the fear ceased, and a queer pleasure took its place, for I discovered that I was not falling quickly, but only floating down. Moreover, I was floating feet foremost, must have turned in descending. At last I touched the stones, but very, very lightly, with only one foot, and instantly at that touch I went up again. Rose to the level of the eaves. People stopped to stare at me. I felt the exultation of power superhuman. I felt for the moment as a god. Then softly I began to sink, and the sight of faces gathering below me prompted a sudden resolve to fly down the street over the heads of the gazers. Again, like a bubble, I rose, and, with the same impulse, I sailed in one grand curve to a distance that astounded me. I felt no wind. I felt nothing but the joy of motion triumphant. Once more touching the pavement, I soared at a bound of four thousand yards. Then, reaching the end of the street, I wheeled and came back by great swoops, by long, slow, aerial leaps of surprising altitude. In the street there was dead silence. Many people were looking, but nobody spoke. I wondered what they thought of my feet, and what they would say if they knew how easily the thing was done.
By the merest chance, I had found out how to do it. And the only reason why it seemed a feat was that no one else had ever attempted it. Instinctively, I felt that to say anything about the accident which had led to the discovery would be imprudent. Then the real meaning of the strange hush in the street began to dawn upon me. I said to myself, This silence is the silence of dreams. I am quite well aware that this is a dream. I remember having dreamed the same dream before. But the discovery of this power is not a dream. It is a revelation. Now that I have learned how to fly, I can no more forget it than a swimmer can forget how to swim. Tomorrow morning I shall astonish the people by sailing over the roofs of the town. Morning came, and I woke with the fixed resolve to fly out of the window. But no sooner had I risen from the bed than the knowledge of physical relations returned, like a sensation forgotten, and compelled me to recognize the unwelcome truth that I had not made any discovery at all. This was neither the first nor the last of such dreams, but it was particularly vivid, and I therefore selected it for narration as a good example of its class. I still fly occasionally, sometimes over fields and streams, sometimes through familiar streets, and the dream is invariably accompanied by remembrance of like dreams in the past as well as by the conviction that I have really found out a secret, really acquired a new faculty. This time, at all events, I say to myself, it is impossible that I can be mistaken. I know that I shall be able to fly after I awake. Many times before, in other dreams, I learned the secret only to forget it on awakening. But this time... I am absolutely sure that I shall not forget. And the conviction actually stays with me until I rise from bed, when the physical effort at once reminds me of the formidable reality of gravitation. The oddest part of this experience is the feeling of buoyancy. It is much like the feeling of floating, of rising or sinking through tepid water, for example. And there is no sense of real effort. It is a delight yet it usually leaves something to be desired. I am a low flyer. I can proceed only like Ptolemy's or flying fish, and far less quickly. Moreover, I must tread earth occasionally in order to obtain a fresh impulsion. I seldom rise to a height of more than twenty-five or thirty feet. The greater part of the time I am merely skimming surfaces. Touching the ground only at intervals of several hundred yards is pleasant skimming but I always feel, in a faint and watery way, the dead pull of the world beneath me. Now the experience of most dream flyers I find to be essentially like my own. I have met but one who claims superior powers. He says that he flies over mountains, goes sailing from peak to peak like a kite. All others whom I have questioned acknowledge that they fly low, in long parabolic curves and this only by touching ground from time to time. Most of them also tell me that their flights usually begin with an imagined fall, or desperate leap, and no less than four say that the start is commonly taken from the top of a stairway. For myriads of years humanity has thus been flying by night. How did the fancied motion, having so little in common with any experience of active life, become a universal experience of the life of sleep. It may be that memory impressions of certain kinds of aerial motion, exultant experiences of leaping or swinging, for example, are in dream revival so magnified and prolonged as to create the illusion of flight. We know that in actual time the duration of most dreams is very brief, but in the half-life of sleep, nightmare offering some startling exceptions, there is scarcely more than a faint smouldering of consciousness by comparison with the quick flash and vivid thrill of active cerebration. And time, to the dreaming brain, would seem to be magnified somewhat, as it must be relatively magnified to the feeble consciousness of an insect. Supposing that any memory of the sensation of falling, together with the memory of the concomitant fear, should be accidentally revived in sleep, 
the dream prolongation of the sensation and the emotion, unchecked by the natural sequence of shock, might suffice to revive other and even pleasurable memories of airy motion, and these again might quicken other combinations of interrelated memories able to furnish all the incident and scenery of long phantasmagoria. But this hypothesis will not fully explain certain feelings and ideas of a character different from any experience of waking hours. The exaltation of voluntary motion without exertion. The pleasure of the utterly impossible. The ghostly delight of imponderability. Neither can it serve to explain the other dream experiences of levitation which do not begin with the sensation of leaping or falling, and are seldom of a pleasurable kind. For example, it sometimes happens during nightmare that the dreamer, deprived of all power to move or speak, actually feels his body lifted into the air and floated away by the force of the horror within him. Again, there are dreams in which the dreamer has no physical being. I have thus found myself without any body, a viewless and voiceless phantom, hovering upon a mountain road in twilight time, and trying to frighten lonely folk by making small, moaning noises. The sensation was of moving through the air by mere act of will. There was no touching of surfaces, and I seemed to glide always about a foot above the road. Could the feeling of dream flight be partially interpreted by organic memory of conditions of life more ancient than man, life weighty and winged and flying heavily a little above the ground? Or might we suppose that some all-permeating oversoul, dormant in other time, wakens within the brain at rare moments of our sleep life? The limited human consciousness has been beautifully compared to the visible solar spectrum above and below, which whole zones of colors invisibly await the evolution of superior senses. And mystics aver that something of the ultraviolet or infrared rays of the vaster mind may be momentarily glimpsed in dreams. Certainly the cosmic life in each of us has been all things in all forms of space and time. Perhaps you would like to believe that it may bestir in slumber some vague sense memory of things more ancient than the sun, memory of vanished planets with fainter powers of gravitation, where the normal modes of voluntary motion would have been like the realization of our flying dreams? End of section 16. Recording by Rich Burgess. Section 17 of Shadowings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rich Burgess. Shadowings by Lefcadio Hearn. Section 17. Nightmare Touch. What is the fear of ghosts among those who believe in ghosts? All fear is the result of experience. Experience of the individual or of the race. Experience either of the present life or of lives forgotten. Even the fear of the unknown can have no other origin, and the fear of ghosts must be a product of past pain. Probably the fear of ghosts, as well as the belief in them, had its beginning in dreams. It is a peculiar fear. No other fear is so intense, yet none is so vague. Feelings thus voluminous and dim are super-individual mostly. Feelings inherited, feelings made within us by the experience of the dead. What experience? Nowhere do I remember reading a plain statement of the reasons why ghosts are feared. Ask any ten intelligent persons of your acquaintance, who remember having once been afraid of ghosts, to tell you exactly why they were afraid, to define the fancy behind the fear. And I doubt whether even one will be able to answer the question. The literature of folklore, oral and written, throws no clear light upon the subject. We find, indeed, various legends of mere torn asunder by phantoms, but such gross imaginings could not explain the peculiar quality of ghostly fear. It is not a fear of bodily violence. It is not even a reasoning fear, 
not a fear that can readily explain itself, which would not be the case if we were founded upon definite ideas of physical danger. Furthermore, although primitive ghosts may have been imagined as capable of tearing and devouring, the common idea of a ghost is certainly that of a being intangible and imponderable. Now, I venture to state boldly that the common fear of ghosts is the fear of being touched by ghosts, or, in other words, that the imagined supernatural is dreaded mainly because of its imagined power to touch. Only to touch, remember, not to wound or kill. But this dread of the touch would itself be the result of experience. Chiefly, I think, of prenatal experience stored up in the individual by inheritance, like the child's fear of darkness, and who can ever have had the sensation of being touched by a ghost? The answer is simple. Everybody who has been seized by phantoms in a dream. Elements of primeval fears, fears older than humanity, doubtless enter into the child terror of darkness. But the more definite fear of ghosts may very possibly be composed with inherited results of dream pain ancestral experience of nightmare and the intuitive terror of supernatural touch can thus be evolutionally explained let me now try to illustrate my theory by relating some typical experiences when about five years old i was condemned to sleep by myself in a certain isolated room thereafter always called the child's room at that time I was scarcely ever mentioned by name, but only referred to as the child. The room was narrow, but very high, and, in spite of one tall window, very gloomy. It contained a fireplace wherein no fire was ever kindled, and the child suspected that the chimney was haunted. A law was made that no light should be left in the child's room at night simply because the child was afraid of the dark. His fear of the dark was judged to be a mental disorder requiring severe treatment. But the treatment aggravated the disorder. Previously I had been accustomed to sleep in a well-lighted room, with a nurse to take care of me. I thought that I should die of fright when sentenced to lie alone in the dark, and, what seemed to me then abominably cruel, actually locked into my room, the most dismal room in the house. Night after night, when I had been warmly tucked into bed, the lamp was removed. The key clicked in the lock. The protecting light and footsteps of my guardian receded together. Then an agony of fear would come upon me. Something in the black air would seem to gather and grow. I thought that I could even hear it grow, till I had to scream. Screaming regularly brought punishment, but it also brought back the light, which more than consoled for the punishment. This fact being at last found out, orders were given to pay no further heed to the screams of the child. Why was I thus insanely afraid? Partly because the dark had always been peopled for me with shapes of terror. So far back as memory extended, I had suffered from ugly dreams and when aroused from them, I could always see the forms dreamed of, lurking in the shadows of the room. They would soon fade out, but for several moments they would appear like tangible realities, and they were always the same figures. Sometimes, without any preface of dreams, I used to see them at twilight time, followed me about from room to room, or reaching long dim hands after me, from story to story, up through the interspaces of the deep stairways. I had complained of these haunters only to be told that I must never speak of them, and that they did not exist. I had complained to everybody in the house, and everybody in the house had told me the very same thing. But there was the evidence of my eyes. The denial of that evidence I could explain only in two ways. Either the shapes were afraid of big people and showed themselves to me alone because I was little and weak, or else the entire household had agreed for some ghastly reason to say what was not true. 
This latter theory seemed to me the more probable one, because I had several times perceived the shapes when I was not unattended, and the consequent appearance of secrecy frightened me scarcely less than the visions did. Why was I forbidden to talk about what I saw, and even heard, on creaking stairways, behind wavering curtains? Nothing will hurt you. This was the merciless answer to all my pleadings not to be left alone at night. But the haunters did hurt me. Only they would wait until after I had fallen asleep and so into their power. For they possessed occult means of preventing me from rising or moving or crying out. Needless to comment upon the policy of locking me up alone with these fears in a black room, Unutterably was I tormented in that room for years. Therefore, I felt relatively happy when sent away at last to a children's boarding school, where the haunters very seldom ventured to show themselves. They were not like any people I had ever known. They were shadowy, dark-robed figures, capable of atrocious self-distortion. Capable, for instance, of growing up to the ceiling and then across it, and then lengthening themselves head downwards along the opposite wall. Only their faces were distant, and I tried not to look at their faces. I tried also in my dreams, or thought that I tried, to awaken myself from the sight of them by pulling at my eyelids with my fingers, but the eyelids would remain closed, as if sealed. Many years afterwards, the frightful plates in Orphelia's Très de Exums, beheld for the first time, recalled to me with a sickening start the dream terrors of childhood. But to understand the child's experience, you must imagine Orphelia's drawings intensely alive, and continually elongating or distorting as in some monstrous anamorphosis. Nevertheless, the mere sight of those nightmare faces was not the worst of the experiences in the child's room. The dreams always began with a suspicion, or sensation of something heavy in the air, slowly quenching will, slowly numbing my power to move. At such times I usually found myself alone in a large, unlighted apartment, and, almost simultaneously with the first sensation of fear, the atmosphere of the room would become suffused, halfway to the ceiling, with a sombre yellowish glow, making objects dimly visible, though the ceiling itself remained pitch black. This was not a true appearance of light. Rather, it seemed as if the black air were changing colour from beneath. Certain terrible aspects of sunset on the eve of storm, offer like effects of sinister colour. Forthwith, I would try to escape, feeling at every step a sensation as of wading, and would sometimes succeed in struggling halfway across the room, but there I would always find myself brought to a standstill, paralysed by some innominable opposition. Happy voices I could hear in the next room. I could see light through the transom over the door that I had vainly endeavoured to reach. I knew that one loud cry would save me, but not even by the most frantic effort could I raise my voice above a whisper. And all this signified only that the nameless was coming, was nearing, was mounting the stairs. I could hear the step, booming like the sound of a muffled drum, and I wondered why nobody else had heard it. A long, long time the haunter would take to come, malevolently pausing after each ghastly footfall. Then, without a creak, the bolted door would open, slowly, slowly, and the thing would enter, gibbering soundlessly, and put out hands, and clutch me, and toss me to the black ceiling, and catch me descending to toss me up again, and again, and again. In those moments, the feeling was not fear. Fear itself had been torpified by the first seizure. It was a sensation that has no name in the language of the living. 
for every touch brought a shock of something infinitely worse than pain something that thrilled into the innermost secret being of me a sort of abominable electricity discovering unimagined capacities of suffering in totally unfamiliar regions of sentiency this was commonly the work of a single tormentor but i can also remember having been caught by a group and tossed from one to another seemingly for a time of many minutes whence the fancy of those shapes i do not know possibly from some impression of fear in earliest infancy possibly from some experience of fear in other lives than mine that mystery is forever insoluble but the mystery of the shock of the touch admits of a definite hypothesis first allow me to observe that the experience of the sensation itself cannot be dismissed as mere imagination imagination means cerebral activity its pains and its pleasures are alike inseparable from nervous operation and their physical importance is sufficient to provide it by their psychological effects dream fear may kill as well as other fear and no emotion thus powerful can be reasonably deemed undeserving of study one remarkable fact in the problem to be considered is that the sensation of seizure in dreams differs totally from all sensations familiar to ordinary waking life why this differentiation how interpret the extraordinary massiveness of the depth of the thrill i have already suggested that the dreamer's fear is most probably not a reflection of relative experience but represents the incalculable total of ancestral experience of dream fear if the sum of the experience of active life be transmitted by inheritance so must likewise be transmitted the summed experience of the life of sleep and in normal heredity either class of transmissions would probably remain distinct now granting this hypothesis the sensation of dream seizure would have had its beginnings in the earliest phases of dream consciousness long prior to the apparition of man the first creatures capable of thought and fear must often have dreamed of being caught by their natural enemies there could not have been much imagining of pain in these primal dreams but higher nervous development in later forms of being would have been accompanied with larger susceptibility to dream pain still later with the growth of reasoning power ideas of the supernatural would have changed and intensified the character of dream fear furthermore through all the course of evolution heredity would have been accumulating the experience of such feeling under those forms of imaginative pain evolved through reaction of religious beliefs there would persist some dim survival of savage primitive fears and again under this a dimmer but incomparable deeper substratum of ancient animal terrors in the dreams of the modern child all these latencies might quicken one below another unfathomably with the coming and the growing of nightmare it may be doubted whether the phantasms of any particular nightmare have a history older than the brain in which they move but the shock of touch would seem to indicate some point of dream contact with the total race experience of shadowy seizure it may be that profundities of self abysses never reached by any ray from the life of sun are strangely stirred in slumber and that out of their blackness immediately responds a shuddering of memory measureless even by millions of years end of section 17 recording by rich burgess Section 18 of Shadowings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. Shadowings by Lafcadio Hearn. Section 18. Readings from a Dream Book. Often, in the blind dead of the night, I find myself reading a book. A big broad book a dream book by dream book i do not mean a book about dreams but a book made of the stuff that dreams are made of i do not know the name of the book nor the name of its author i have not been able to see the title page and there is no running title as for the back of the volume it remains 
like the back of the moon invisible forever at no time have i touched the book in any way not even to turn a leaf somebody always viewless holds it up and open before me in the dark and i can read it only because it is lighted by a light that comes from nowhere above and beneath and on either side of the book there is darkness absolute but the pages seem to retain the yellow glow of lamps that once illuminated them a queer fact is that i never see the entire text of a page at once though i see the whole page itself plainly the text rises or seems to rise to the surface of the paper as i gaze and fades out almost immediately after having been read by a simple effort of will i can recall the vanished sentences to the page but they do not come back in the same form as before they seem to have been oddly revised during the interval never can i coax even one fugitive line to reproduce itself exactly as it read at first but i can always force something to return and this something remains sharply distinct during perusal then it turns faint gray and appears to sink as through thick milk backward out of sight by regularly taking care to write down immediately upon awakening whatever i could remember reading in the dream book i found myself able last year to reproduce portions of the text but the order in which i now present these fragments is not at all the order in which i recovered them if they seem to have any interconnection this is only because i tried to arrange them in what i imagine to be the rational sequence of their original place and relation i know scarcely anything and even regarding the character of the book itself i have been able to discover only that a great part of it consists of dialogues about the unthinkable fragment one then the wave prayed to remain a wave for ever the sea made answer nay thou must break there is no rest in me billions of billions of times thou wilt rise again to break and break to rise again the wave complained i fear thou sayest i shall rise again but when did ever a wave return from the place of breaking the sea responded times countless beyond utterance thou hast broken and yet thou art behold the myriads of the waves that run before thee and the myriads that pursue behind thee all have been to the place of breaking times unspeakable and thither they hasten now to break again into me they melt only to swell anew but pass they must for there is not any rest in me murmuring the wave replied shall i not be scattered presently to mix with the mingling of all these myriads how should i rise again never never again can i become the same the same thou never art returned the sea at any two moments in thy running perpetual change is the law of thy being what is thine eye always thou art shaped with the substance of waves forgotten waves numberless beyond the sands of the shores of me in thy multiplicity what art thou a phantom an impermanency real is pain sobbed the wave and fear and hope and the joy of the light whence and what are these if i be not real thou hast no pain the sea responded nor fear nor hope nor joy thou art nothing save in me i am thyself thine eye thy form is my dream thy motion is my will thy breaking is my pain break thou must because there is no rest in me but thou wilt break only to rise again for death is the rhythm of life lo i too die that i may live these my waters have passed and will pass again with wrecks of innumerable worlds to the burning of innumerable suns i too am multiple unspeakably dead tides of millions of oceans revive in mine ebb and flow suffice thee to learn that only because thou wast thou art and that because thou art thou wilt become again muttered the wave i cannot understand answered the sea thy part is to pulse and pass never to understand i also even i the great sea do not understand 
Fragment two. The stones and the rocks have felt. The winds have been breath and speech. The rivers and oceans of earth have been locked into chambers of hearts. And the palingenesis cannot cease till every cosmic particle shall have passed through the uttermost possible experience of the highest possible life. But what of the planetary core? Has that too felt and thought? Even so, surely is that all flesh has been sun-fire. In the ceaseless succession of integrations and dissolutions, all things have shifted relation and place numberless billions of times. Hearts of old moons will make the surface of future worlds. Fragment 3 No regret is vain. It is sorrow that spins the thread. Softer than moonshine, thinner than fragrance, stronger than death, the Gleipnir chain of the greater memory. In millions of years you will meet again, and the time will not seem long, for a million years and a moment are the same to the dead. Then you will not be all of your present self, nor she be all that she has been. Both of you will at once be less and yet incomparably more. Then, to the longing that must come upon you, body itself will seem but a barrier through which you would leap to her, or, it may be, to him. For sex will have shifted numberless times ere then. Neither will remember, but each will be filled with a feeling immeasurable of having met before. Fragment 4 so wronging the being who loves the being blindly imagined but of yesterday this mocker mocks the divine in the past of the soul of the world then in that heart is revived the countless million sorrows buried in forgotten graves all the old pain of love in its patient contest with hate since the beginning of time and the gods know the dim ones who dwell beyond space, spinning the mysteries of shape and name, for they sit at the roots of life, and the pain runs back to them, and they feel that wrong, as the spider feels in the trembling of her web that a thread is broken. Fragment 5 Love at sight is the choice of the dead, but the most of them are older than ethical systems and the decision of their majorities is rarely moral. They choose by beauty, according to their memory of physical excellence, and as bodily fitness makes the foundation of mental and moral power, they are not apt to choose ill. Nevertheless, they are sometimes strangely cheated. They have been known to want beings that could never help ghosts to a body, hollow goblins, Fragment 6. The animuli making the self do not fear death as dissolution. They fear death only as reintegration, recombination with the strange and the hateful of other lives. They fear the imprisonment within another body of that which loves together with that which loathes. Fragment 7. In other times, the L woman sat only in waste places and by solitary ways. But now, in the shadows of cities, she offers her breasts to youth. And he whom she entices presently goes mad and becomes, like herself, a hollowness. For the higher ghosts that entered into the making of him perish at that goblin touch, die as the pupa dies in the cocoon, leaving only a shell and dust behind. Fragment 8. The man said to the multitude remaining of his souls, I am weary of life. And the remnant replied to him, We also are weary of the shame and pain of dwelling in so vile a habitation. Continually we strive that the beams may break and the pillars crack and the roof fall in upon us. Surely there is a curse upon me, groaned the man, there is no justice in the gods. Then the souls tumultuously laughed in scorn, 
even as the leaves of a wood in the wind do chuckle all together and they made answer to him as a fool thou liest did any save thyself make thy vile body was it shapen or misshapen by any deeds or thoughts except thine own no deed or thought can i remember returned the man deserving that which has come upon me remember laughed the souls no the folly was in other lives but we remember and remembering we hate ye are all one with me cried the man how can ye hate one with thee mocked the souls as the wearer is one with his garment how can we hate as the fire that devours the wood from which it is drawn by the fire-maker even so we can hate it is a cursed world cried the man why did ye not guide me the souls replied to him thou wouldst not heed the guiding of ghosts that were wiser than we cowards and weaklings curse the world the strong do not blame the world it gives them all that they desire by power they break and take and keep life for them is a joy a triumph an exultation but creatures without power merit nothing and nothingness becomes their portion thou and we shall presently enter into nothingness do ye fear asked the man there is reason for fear the souls answered yet no one of us would wish to delay the time of what we fear by continuing to make part of such an existence as thine but ye have died innumerable times wonderingly said the man no we have not said the souls nor even once that we can remember and our memory reaches back to the beginnings of this world we die only with the race the man said nothing being afraid the souls resumed thy race ceases its continuance depended upon thy power to serve our purposes thou hast lost all power what art thou but a charnel house a mortuary pit freedom we needed and space here we have been compacted together a billion to a pinpoint doorless our chambers and blind and the passages are blocked and broken and the stairways lead to nothing also there are haunters here not of our kind things never to be named for a little time the man thought gratefully of death and dust but suddenly there came into his memory a vision of his enemy's face with a wicked smile upon it and then he wished for longer life a hundred years of life and pain only to see the grass grow tall above the grave of that enemy and the souls mocked his desire thine enemy will not waste much thought upon thee he is no half man thine enemy the ghosts in that body have room and great light high are the ceilings of their habitation wide and clear the passageways luminous the courts and pure like a fortress excellently garrisoned is the brain of thine enemy and to any point thereof the defending hosts can be gathered for battle in a moment together his generation will not cease nay that face of his will multiply throughout the centuries because thine enemy in every time provided for the needs of his higher ghosts he gave heed to their warnings he pleasured them in all just ways he did not fail in reverence to them wherefore they now have power to help him at his need how hast thou reverenced or pleasured us the man remained silent for a space then as in horror of doubting he questioned wherefore should ye fear if nothingness be the end what is nothingness the souls responded only in the language of delusion is there an end that which thou callest the end is in truth but the very beginning the essence of us cannot cease in the burning of worlds it cannot be consumed it will shudder in the cores of great stars it will quiver in the light of other suns and once more in some future cosmos it will reconquer knowledge but only after evolutions unthinkable for multitude even out of the nameless beginnings of form and thence through every cycle of vanished being 
through all successions of exhausted pain through all the abyss of the past it must climb again the man uttered no word the soul spoke on for millions of millions of ages must we shiver in tempests of fire then shall we enter anew into some slime primordial there to quicken and again writhe upward through all foul dumb blind shapes innumerable the metamorphoses immeasurable the agonies and the fault is not of any gods it is thine good or evil muttered the man what signifies either the best must become as the worst in the grind of the endless change nay cried out the souls for the strong there is a goal the goal that thou couldst not strive to gain they will help to the fashioning of fairer worlds they will win to larger light they will tower and soar as flame to enter the zones of the divine but thou and we go back to slime think of the billion summers that might have been for us think of the joys the loves the triumphs cast away the dawns of the knowledge undreamed the glories of sense unimagined the exultations of illimitable power think think o oh fool of all that thou hast lost then the souls of the man turned themselves into worms and devoured him end of section 18「Section 19 of Shadowings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rich Burgess. Shadowings by Lafcadio Hearn. Section 19. In a Pair of Eyes. There is one adolescent moment never to be forgotten. The moment when the boy learns that this world contains nothing more wonderful than a certain pair of eyes. At first the surprise of the discovery leaves him breathless. Instinctively he turns away his gaze. That vision seemed too delicious to be true. But presently he ventures to look again, fearing with a new fear, afraid of the reality, afraid also of being observed. And lo! His doubt dissolves into a new shock, of ecstasy. Those eyes are even more wonderful than he had imagined. Nay, they become more and yet more entrancing every successive time that he looks at them. Surely, in all the universe there cannot be another such pair of eyes. What can lend them such enchantment? Why do they appear divine? He feels that he must ask somebody to explain must propound to older and wiser heads the riddle of his new emotions. Then he makes his confession, with a faint intuitive fear of being laughed at, but with a strange, fresh sense of rapture in the telling. Laughed at he is, tenderly, but this does not embarrass him nearly so much as the fact that he can get no answer to his question, to the simple why made so interesting by his frank surprise and his timid blushes. No one is able to enlighten him, but all can sympathize with the bewilderment of his sudden awakening from the long soul sleep of childhood. Perhaps that why never can be fully answered, but the mystery that prompted it constantly tempts one to theorize, and theories may have a worth independent of immediate results had it not been for old theories concerning the unknowable what should we have been able to learn about the knowable was it not while in pursuit of the impossible that we stumbled upon the undreamed of and infinitely marvellous possible why indeed should a pair of human eyes appear for a time to us so beautiful that when likening their radiance to splendour of diamond or amethyst or emerald we feel the comparison a blasphemy why should we find them deeper than the sea, deeper than the day, deep even as the night of space, with its scintillant mist of suns? Certainly not because of mere wild fancy. These thoughts, these feelings, must spring from some actual perception of the marvellous, 
some veritable revelation of the unspeakable. There is, in very truth, one brief hour of life during which the world holds for us nothing so wonderful as a pair of eyes, and then, while looking into them, we discover a thrill of awe vibrating through our delight, awe made by a something felt rather than seen, a latency, a power, a shadowing of depth unfathomable as the cosmic ether. It is as though, through some intense and sudden stimulation of vital being, we had obtained, for one supercelestial moment, the glimpse of a reality never before imagined, and never again to be revealed. There is indeed an illusion. We seem to view the divine, but this divine itself, whereby we are dazzled and duped, is a ghost. Not to actuality belongs the spell, not to anything that is, but to some infinite composite phantom of what has been. Wondrous the vision, but wondrous only because our mortal sight then pierces beyond the surface of the present into profundities of myriads of years, pierces beyond the mask of life into the enormous night of death. For a moment we are made aware of a beauty and a mystery and a depth unutterable, then the veil falls again forever. The splendor of the eyes that we worship belongs to them only as brightness to the morning star. It is a reflex from beyond the shadow of the now, a ghost light of vanished suns. Unknowingly within that maiden gaze we meet the gaze of eyes more countless than the hosts of heaven eyes otherwhere passed into darkness and dust. Thus, and only thus, the depth of that gaze is the depth of the sea of death and birth, and its mystery is the world soul's vision, watching us out of the silent vast of the abyss of being. Thus, and only thus, do truth and illusion mingle in the magic of eyes, the spectral past suffusing the with charm ineffable the apparition of the present, and the sudden splendor in the soul of the seer is but a flash, one soundless sheet lightning of the infinite memory. End of section 19. Recording by Rich Burgess. End of Shadowings by Lafcadio Hearn.